Good evening. So I'm going to talk about log-free programming. It is a technique that was first proposed around the mid-1990s that was aimed to address the problems faced by traditional log-based approaches. So first, some background. I guess some is already covered by Matthew. So over the past few years, we have experienced increasingly difficulty in maintaining the same kind of speed increase in single core CPUs as predicted by the Moore's law. There's various reasons for this. The, might, the size of transistors just can't shrink anymore, or maybe the gap between the speed of the memory and the CPU is ever widening. So after about 2005, people have started to explore other options to increase the speed of processors. And one of the most successful ones is to move from single core CPUs to multi-cores. And indeed, nowadays we can't even find any, well, it's very hard to find any computers with only a single core. So to fully exploit the potential of running things in parallel, programmers have invented the notion of threads, which is a smaller execu execution unit than process. Threads have their own instruction stream, their own registers, but they share the same memory. There are a lot of ways that they may use the, same, the shared memory. They might use it for communication. For example, one thread may put some message in a known memory location and then somehow signal the other threads to like, read it. Or they might compete for the same memory resource. This is the case for most shared variables, like different threads are going to read and write into it all at the same time. From our concurrent course, we have seen that interleaving access to memory from different threads will cause inconsistent state for different threads and possibly to incorrect execution of the program. We also see one of the examples later. Traditionally, we avoid this by synchronization, mainly by locking, using primitives like mutex, semaphore, or many others. For example, a mutex is just, you can understand it as a token associated with critical sections of code, such that when, whenever we try to execute this code, we must obtain the token first. And if the token has already been obtained by some other thread, we will just wait. So I guess the question to ask is, why do we want to lock free? Well, it's because locks sometimes have problems. For certain sections of, for certain components of uh, code, using locks might lead to situations where the program can get stuck forever, or the program may make progress, but in a very slow way. For example, deadlock is a situation where two threads, each holding a mutex, try to acquire the mutex that is held by the other thread. And obviously, no threads can make any progress because they'll just be sleeping forever. Priority inversion is when a high priority thread competes with a low priority thread for the same mutex. But it got unlucky. So the low priority thread obtained the mutex and got scheduled less often by the scheduler because it's low priority. So the high priority thread is forced to sleep until the low priority thread can finish its work and release the mutex. And in the meantime, the medium priority thread is gonna be scheduled more often than high priority thread, and thus the name inversion. Convoying is a case where several threads compete for the same mutex. Because at the same time, only one thread can get it. So all the other threads are gonna to try to acquire it, fail, and then give up on its time quantum and force a context switch. So most of the programs, the time quantum uh, allocated to the process is gonna be spent in context switching, which is very inefficient. And lastly, suppose when a thread is holding a mutex and it's killed or it crashed or it's preempted by the scheduler, then obviously any other threads who want that mutex cannot proceed any further. There are, pro there are ways to deal with this using locks, but it's very complicated and error prone. So people come up with the idea of lock free. First of all, let's get something clear. The lock here is a verb, 
as in locking up, but not a noun, as in locks, like mutex. So the correct meaning of lock free is that it is impossible to lock up the program given any circumstance. Of course, this directly implies that we do not use locks, but not the other way around, because program can indeed lock up without using locks. We could understand it as, if given enough time, we are guaranteed that some, pro some threads of the program will make process. And here we define making pro progress by some method called returns. So how do we actually do it? Well, from the previous slide, we noticed that a lot of the problems are due to bad things happen inside the log. So what if we shrink the scope of the log until it spans only one single CPU instruction? So the programmer cannot do anything bad inside that log, and we just avoid most of our problems. Well, obviously, this will require some hardware support. At the very minimum, we need the instruction set to provide such an instruction. And such an instruction is called atomic operation. It's a single CPU instruction, so it's indivisible. So no interrupts can happen within it. And it's a granularized log in that you can understand it as we obtain some log, we do some stuff, then we release that log all in one single instruction. Examples include atomic load and store or the category of read, modify, write. For example, there are increments, decrements, and compare and swap are all read, modify, write instructions. Compare and swap, acronym as CAS, is a very useful instruction in log free programming. We'll see an example here. Suppose we want to change the value of the variable x from A to B. If we were using logs, we need to first acquire the mutex as protecting x. We check if it's A. If it's equal to A, we check, change it to B. If it's not, we just do nothing. And then we release the mutex. If we're using atomic operations, we just do compare and swap x, A, B. Three operands, and all in one single instruction. In most architecture, compare and swap will return the original value stored in x, plus the name swap. But here we assume that it returns some error code, like success or failure, for easy like, use. Let's look at an example. Uh, stack. We're all familiar with stacks, I presume. Here we just implemented with a linked list. A node has a data, of which type we don't really care, and a next, which is a pointer to the next node. And the stack has a field called head, which is traditionally the top of the stack. It is also a pointer to a node. And we make it atomic, such that the operations on it are atomic and won't conflict with each other. And the usual push and pop of stacks. Note that some stacks provide its empty method, but here we don't. Because in log-free programming, by definition, there is no way we can guarantee that no other threads will change the stack between the time is empty returns and the time actually evaluated or we test it. So whatever value is returned by is empty, by the time we use it, it will be meaningless. So it doesn't make sense to have it here. So first, let's look at push. Three single, very simple steps. We create a new node based on the data we was given. We set its next pointer to the value of current head, such that it will be the new head. And then we just update the head pointer of the stack. This will have a lot of problems if different threads are executing it. Here, I'll just look at one single example. Suppose there are two threads, each trying to execute push. Thread A completed with first two steps, so we create a new node and point to the current head, current top. Then it got preempted by the scheduler, and thread B runs and finish the pop. So the head current, current now points to the node that B creates. Then thread A resumes and set, node, set head to the address of the node that A just created. However, currently from the stack's perspective, there is no reference to the node that B just created. So that node is effectively lost. And that's bad, of course. 
So we can notice that the problem here is that between the time that A reads from head and A writes to head, head is changed by the thread, but A didn't realize that. So we can just protect it with the compare and swap. Here's the pseudocode for that. Following the, the steps, we just create a new node. And here we use a while loop because compare and swap may fail as we previously said. And if it fails, we have to try again. Inside the loop, we set new nodes next to be the current head. And next, we store the, our understanding of head in a temporary variable called old head to be later used in compare and swap. Next comes the compare and swap. We check if head is still, if it is still what we think it is. If it is, we change it to new head, new node. And if it isn't, we just try again. Run another iteration. There is a couple of things to note in this code. Firstly, we use new node. This implicitly calls the memory allocator to allocate space for a new node in the heap. So we require the memory allocator to be log free, or otherwise our program which uses it won't be log free either. And secondly, here, when we try to store our temporary understanding of head, we must read from new node.next instead of read directly from head, because head might be changed between these two instructions. And lastly, how do we prove it's log free? Well, recall the definition that log free defines that given enough time, some threads will, the method call will return. So consider the first iteration. If compare and swap succeeds, we break free from the loop and our threads returns, so we are log free. If compare and swap fails, that means between the time we read from head and the time we compare and swap it, some other threads have successfully changed the head, the stack. And later we'll see that the only way we can change the stack is by success, su successfully returning some function call, whether it's push or pop. And thus, if compare and swap fails, that means some other threads must have succeeded and we are log free. Next is pop. It's a little bit more complicated, but still simple. We first read the current value of head and we check if the stack is null. If the stack is empty, we have a lot of options. We can do the blocking way in which we wait for another thread to push. Or we can do the non-blocking way. We can just return nothing to indicate there's nothing in the stack now, ask later. Or we could throw an exception. Through an exception is sensible for a single threaded stack, but for a log free stack, since we have no way for the user to actually check if the stack is empty, it doesn't really make sense to throw an exception, right? So next, we can set head to point to the head door next, which should be the new top after we've popped it, and return data from the node that we just popped from and delete the node if we are managing memory ourselves. Some languages have automatic garbage collectors, but as we just said, if the garbage collector is not log free, which many automatic garbage collectors are not, then our program are not log free. So in most log free programs, we manage memory ourselves. Here's the code. We don't need to create a new node, so we just enter the loop right away. We read from head, we check if it is, the stack is empty. If it is, we just loop until it is not. And then we store the temporary value of the new top if we were to su successfully pop from the stack. Then we do a compare and swap on it to try to move the pointer from old head to new head. If we succeed, we just break and return the data. If we didn't, we have to try again. Again, there are a couple of things about this code. It looks correct, well, I hope it is, but it really has a lot of bug. For example, signal of this line. Between the time we check old head is null and the time we actually dereference it to get its next field, some other threads might have popped 
the top node of the stack and free the memory. So when you try to evaluate old head to next, you'll get a segmentation fault. This will be addressed together with the next problem called the ABA problem. The ABA problem, ABA there, is not an acronym. It is a description of the problem, actually. So it describes a situation where, suppose, in the memory location x, we ha already have value a, the first a, and then thread one reads a from x, and it, it got paused. Thread two comes in and stores b and a into x in turn. So that's the name aba. And then thread one resumes and reads a from x, and thinks there's no modification to x while I'm sleeping. Well, this might not look like a big problem for basic data types, but for pointer types, this will lead to a big problem, yeah. For our stack, we really do suffer from that problem. Suppose there are currently two threads access accessing the stack, and before everything starts, the stack contains three items, C, B, A, where A is the top element. Thread one executes first, it tries to pop, it finishes the first two steps, it reads A from head, and it evaluates A dot next, which currently has the value B. And then it, it got preempted. Thread root comes in, it pops two times, so the stack is leave, left with just C, and then it runs push. And coincidentally, when creating the new node, the memory system actually reuses the address A. So the stack after the push becomes C, oh sorry, A, where A is the head. And then thread one just resumes and concludes that head is still A, so it's not changed. Let's change it to B. And it succeeds in that. However, at this time, B is popped off the stack and possibly freed by pop. So really, there could be anything inside B, and our stack is basically corrupt. There are many solutions to this problem. The first one is to use a modification counter. It's basically a tag for the pointer. So before, our pointer only had the address, but now our pointer contains two parts, address and count. And whenever we try to modify our pointer, the address part, we automatically increment the count, such that when we try to compare pointers, that both address and count must match. So if some other threads have modified the, the pointer while A is sleeping, he will see that the count has been increased and he will know. Uh, but this approach do really require a double word cast if we really use one word for count because both the address and count must be changed atomically. And it is not ideal in that it is still possible that the ABA problem occurs. So back to our example. Suppose we are really unlucky. While thread A is sleeping, thread 2 did 2 to the 32 number of changes to the stack. And after all these changes, the head of stack happens to be A again. So when thread 1 comes in, it just tries to do cast, it compares the address, compares the count, both match. So a big problem comes back again. So Next, the deferred reclamation is a proper way for the handling ABA problem. And as you can imagine, it's more expensive than the modification count. The basic idea is to we only free the memory when we make sure no other threads actually pointing to it. So understandably, this will also solve the segmentation fault problem that we just described. And there are many ways for that, and they are quite similar. Uh, firstly, we could have a threads in pop counter because we noticed that the only thing that threads could be free in memory is inside pop. So whenever a thread enters pop, we increment this counter, or this counter is a global variable accessible by all the threads. We increment the counter, and when a thread tries to delete a node, it checks if the counter is one. That means itself is the only thread inside pop. And only if it's one, it can delete the node. Otherwise, it will chain it to a global 
to be deleted list to be deleted later by other threads running pop. And the second one, reference counting is a bit more precise. Because threads, it's not that if other threads are in pop, we can't delete the node. It's only that when other threads are referencing to the node that we are trying to delete, that we can't delete it. So reference counting is just like normal garbage collecting. We associate a reference count to each memory address, and we only delete it when the reference count is zero or one. Yeah. And lastly, has a pointers. That's also very similar. The difference with the previous two is that we have a separate garbage collector thread. And when we try to free the node, we don't free it ourselves. We pass the pointer to the thread. And globally, there is a hazard pointer array corresponding to each thread. And each thread puts the node that it's currently handling inside the array. So when the garbage collector tries to free the memory, it will just scan the whole array and check there's no node that's currently accessed by other thread. Next is the problem of memory reordering. This has been estimated to be over half of the possible bugs encountered in log-free programming. But first, let's introduce the notion of sequential consistency. It is a property of architecture that requires the result of any execution to be as if it's all run in some sequential order and the operations appear in that sequential order as specified by the program. So as you might imagine, the name suggests reordering really conflict with sequential consistency. Yeah, and indeed, if there is sequential consistency, in other words, there can be no reordering of memory instructions. But most CPUs don't really support sequential consistency, or they don't support it by default, because it's very expensive. So without sequential consistency, there are four possible memory reorderings from this compiler or from the CPU, both on purpose or maybe just necessary for performance. And a reorder consists of two memory instructions, and since there are two types of memory instructions, there are four types of reorder, as you can see. The principle that compiler and CPU follows when they do reorder is that the program when run on a single core CPU will still be guaranteed as correct. But too bad we're not running on a single CPU. Well, as you might imagine, that memory reordering mainly causes problems for inter-thread messaging. And unfortunately, our stack is too simple to have any of such type. So I have to give a separate example. Suppose we have global variables, x, y, r1, r2, both initialized to zero. In thread one, we assign to x and read from y. In thread two, we assign to y and read from x. Since the load always comes after the store, no matter how thread one and thread two are scheduled, if there isn't memory reordering, the case where r1 equals zero and r2 equals zero is impossible. Right. But as we will see, it is possible. Here's a simple code I wrote for, no, I wrote, copied, for actually seeing this problem. Let's see, we have global variables, x, y, r1, r2, and in thread one function, we wait for a random amount of time because the timing requirement for the reorder to actually manifest itself is very subtle. So we just loop and try a different random amount of time every time we try and see if we can hit that. So in thread one, we assign to x and read from y. In thread two, we just assign to y and read from x. In the main method, we do a for loop, which loops forever. And every time before the iteration, we reset the value of x and y. We start both threads, wait for them to finish, and check if r1 and r2 are both zero. If it is, we print some statement that the reorder detected. So this is a virtual machine of Ubuntu. 
which has two cores. So by right, this problem will happen. Now, let's look at another virtual machine, which is Ubuntu as well, but has only one core. So from our previous discussion, we we will expect that no reordering will occur in this example, and indeed. We see that it's really rare. It's only after like tens of hundreds of iterations that such things could happen. And that's the problem with memory reordering bugs, because they really require really specific timing for this bug to really up happen. And so it's really hard for testing. Well, the solution is very easy because CPUs they usually offer you with instructions that prevents a certain type of memory reorder. So you just add them where you identify that you need them. The identification part is really hard. You need to identify the right level of protection for memory that you need because an extra layer of protection which you don't need is very expensive. Or you could just specify the CPU affinity to force multiple threads to run on the same CPU. But that kind of defeats the purpose of having multiple CPUs. So next is the performance, actual. Here is the stack throughput for measured with both a mutex and a log free. The Y axis is the stack throughput and the x-axis is the number of threads. Well, this isn't good, right? Because we said earlier that the performance of log three should be better than logs. Well, as we look deeper into the problem, actually examine the activity of the thread, we see that most of the CPU time is actually trying to compare and swap and fail and trying and fail. So that's very wasteful. Imagine what will happen if you just make the thread sleep for amount of time after each failed compare and swap attempt. So here we make it sleep for 250 milliseconds and here is the result. The green one represents the sleeped version of log three and we can see that it's really a good improvement. So to summarize, to write a log-free code, we can just write out the steps that we needed for the problem. We see what can go wrong if multiple threads are executing the program at the same time. And we protect access to shared data with atomic operations like CAS. And if we are passing message from one thread to another, we need to watch out for memory reordering bugs. And if there are multiple writers to the same memory location, we need to take care of the ABA problem. Yeah. So in general, log-free programming is very complex and it's not possible to actually convert the whole program to log-free. So usually people just only convert the part that are critical, that are critical to performance to into log-free, like our stack. Suppose it's a data structure that the code uses. And also, it, we're not saying that logs are bad because if implemented correctly, the logs can actually perform slightly better than log free, the log free version. So, this is my reference and any questions? 